So we are making uh, direct conversion detectors. Uh, we are currently the largest uh, producer of detectors based on, on CADTEL. We are producing about 3,000 of these detector hybrids per month, which ends up being around 6,000 detectors per year. And we're based, as I said, in Espo, outside of, of Helsinki, where we have all our production and uh, R&D uh, for uh, charge integration devices. Uh, Stockholm is, is group headquarters, and we have the R&D for, uh, for photon counting uh, detectors there. Uh, London, we have sales and marketing and software development. So the core technology, what we do is that we are directly converting the x-rays into charge. So we're using a semiconductor. Uh, in our case, we're using CADTEL or CADZINCTEL to directly convert the x-rays into electrical signals that we can detect. In comparison to the, the scintillating devices, we are using one step less and we don't get the blurring out of, of the scintillator. So we have two product brands. Uh, one is IAT, which is mainly done in, in Finland. Uh, it is charge integration uh, devices. Biggest application is, is dental applications for dental uh, panoramic systems. X-Counter is the photon counting products, which is what I'm going to focus on. What we do is we have both standard uh, type products, which you see uh, behind me here, uh, standard uh, different lengths, uh, standard products. We also do some OEM uh, custom-made detectors, so if someone wants a special shape like the one you see here with the x-rays in the middle and detectors around it, that's something we can do since we have a, a very modular design. We can build basically <coughs> almost any shape that, that the customer is requiring. So market segments we're active in is, is, is quite uh, broad. We're using a lot of our detectors in, in weld integrity. One of the important things with, with the direct conversion and the CADTEL is that we can make it quite thick without losing uh, position resolution. So we can use thick, like two millimeter thick uh, CADTEL, so we're using it in applications where uh, using cobalt 60 sources, for example, up to 1.2 MeVs. Of course, the, the conversion efficiency isn't great, but still the position accuracy that we're getting out of the detector is, is very good. And we do, we control the whole chain uh, from developing ASICs uh, ourselves. So we make our own ASICs. Of course, we don't produce the ASICs. We buy them out, out of TSMC. Uh, we get the wafers in. We do our processing to grow uh, the bumps uh, on the wafers. Uh, we do dicing and then we do bump bonding. And we do automatic die placing, wire bonding, uh, to form it into, into detectors. And that's basically where our business ends. So we have no systems at the moment. We build some systems to show what we can do. Uh, so the big benefits of, of photon counting is basically three things. There is no readout noise. If you do it correctly, there is no readout noise. We can do one photon per second or we can do a million photons per second in a pixel and there is no added noise to it. Since it's all digital, it's also very fast. Once we're done with the frame, we don't need to digitize all the pixels. They're already digital in the pixel. Uh, and one of the other things that is, is unique to photon counting uh, is that we can do energy resolution in each pixel. So we can determine the pulse height of photon coming in. So if we look at the, the absence of noise, in this case the example is, is that we have taken an, an x-ray source, 120 kV, and then put a pinhole in front of the detector and it gives us very few photons coming back. In this case white means two photons, black means zero photons. Uh, so this is at five seconds. Now if we continue just leave the shutter open for, for longer, the image just get better and better. The other end of, of the spectra is very high photon fluxes, which is what generally is, is more challenging in, in a photon counting detector. Uh, in this example, the white, this is 120 kV 
and 320 milliamps. Uh, so we get about five times 10 to the eight photons per millimeter square in the white beam. And you can still see out here that we recover the structure of our carbon fiber table outside, uh, outside of the patient here. So for the dual energy, what we can do is to, to do material separation. So in this case, it is, this is a standard image. It's photon counting in this case, but it could as well be in a charge integration signal. In the top one, we've highlighted the, the calcium, where there is calcium content. In the bottom right one, we have removed uh, the bones. So this is all acquired with one single shot image. Uh, it's actually the same image that we use in all of these. It's just that we've applied the material uh, compensation algorithms to uh, get rid of that. So all of our detectors that, that we build are uh, typically three side buttable. One of the challenging tasks with, with the photon counting detector is to make a really big area because it contains a lot of electronics and it's really hard to squeeze that into, you can squeeze it into a flat panel, for example. Uh, so we can do in excess of 2,000 frames per second. Uh, we can do very fast scanning. Uh, the, the long detectors is typically used for conveyor belt scanning where you have an object passing by at speeds up to 2 meters per second and we can still maintain 100 micron resolution at that speed. The challenge then is of course to get enough photons to get statistics in, in, in the image. So we can cope with the flux up to 10 to the 9 photons per millimeter square per second, um, which is on the limit to where the actual uh, cadmium telluride starts to, to polarize because the uh, mobility of the holes is lower than the mobility of the electrons, which is what we're collecting. And that means that at some point there will be enough holes that they shield uh, the electric field. Uh, so typically in a pixel it's in excess of 2000 transistors uh, so in comparison to a, a TFT flat panel you may have three transistors in a pixel which, so it's quite quite a big difference it contains a lot of more information of course it contains the counters and and, and the logic for uh, for the charge sharing and so on with the uh, direct conversion we also get very sharp images uh, since there is no blur uh, in the converter uh, this is a 75 micron detector, this is a 100 micron detector. And, um, the other thing we do when we go to fast frame rates is, is an example here for, for a CT. So if you focus on this thing here, this is required 2000 frames for one revolution, um, which is requiring then high frame rates because you don't want to spend too long time going around. So at 2000 frames, uh, about a thousand frames and now 600 frames and now if we're comparing to a MAMO system that might have 300 frames this structure is completely gone and this is because of, of this sampling uh, or the rotation while sampling it's not the step and shoot and that's why the periphery is blurred you still see good resolution in the center of rotation of course because you don't have the blurring but since for a MAMO system, you want to see microcalcifications also in, in the periphery of the breast. And one uh, good example of that is our friends from ABCT, so uh, just next door to us, uh, who's making a dedicated breast CT scanner uh, using the photon counting detectors, uh, 100 micron pixels, so with the geometric magnification of the tube and can generate really nice uh, mammography CT images uh, at low dose. So the other thing, of course, we're generating a lot of frames. That's if you would be adding a little bit of noise from any or from all of the frames when you add up several thousands of them to do a reconstruction, you will be adding up a lot of noise. So to get the dual energy, we're simply threshold, we get the pulse height from the incoming photon. The pulse height is, is proportional to the energy of the photon and we have just two thresholds. We increment 
one or both, depending on, on, on the energy of the incoming photon. Doing that, we can take an image pretty much like the rat it showed before. In this case, it's a bit more clear. This is a, um, a phantom with different thicknesses of, of plexiglass and aluminum. And this is a standard image. If you do the, the separation in, in plexiglass and aluminum, you can actually, the values you're getting here is the thickness of, uh, of the material. So you can completely uh, separate the other, uh, the other. Applications for this is, for example, in uh, food inspection. This is an image of a, a granola packet moving at, at half a meter per second on the conveyor belt. This is a standard image. Now, if you do the material separation, we can start to see these pieces of, of PVC. So this is ranging in, the in thickness from 0.5 millimeters up to two millimeters of, of thickness of the PVC. And due to the fact that we can remove the structured background in, in, in the signal, we can see uh, the PVC. Another example is a chest. So this is a standard chest image when we use the dual energy. We can subtract the ribs. Now, the grayscale wasn't really matching, but I think you can appreciate that uh, the ribs are very well subtracted from the image. So, one important thing when we do the, the charge, um, sensing the height of the charge, is to make sure that, that we collect all the charge into one pixel. So we can have the, the uh, pixel being hit by a photon, everything is within one pixel, everything is fine, but it can also be between two pixels, and then we can either count both pixels, or depending on the threshold, we don't count anything, in, in, and then we lose, lose the thing. To make it even more complicated, uh, the physics in the converter, uh, it's also possible that there is characteristic x-rays, you can generate secondary events within uh, the crystal, that would then generate an event that can occur uh, quite far from, um, uh, from the actual point of, of interaction. So in the case of, of cadmium telluride, that, that's around 25 keV, and an average attenuation length of that is around 70 microns. So you can imagine that even if you hit the center of the pixel, the probability is pretty high that you end up with the charge in, in a neighbor pixel. So you would end up with something like this you generate several charges. So what we do is to, to sum the signal from the neighbor pixels, and we just give the count to the pixel that has the highest charge. So that is done in, uh, in real time in the pixels, and it's critical to maintain a good uh, spectral resolution. So this shows an americium spectra acquired without the anti-coincidence logic and this is what it looks like when we turn on the anti-coincidence logic. And comparing the two, you can see that there is a big difference. And what you really see down at the low energies is the spread between pixels and it is charge sharing uh, between, between pixels. So without going into too much details on this, if we do a material separation, uh, we look at the signal difference we can get if we completely subtract the aluminium, we go from uh, a normalized SDNR of, of, of 0 0.4 up to 1. So that means that we have 2.5 times better SDNR with the anti-coincidence logic uh, or charge sharing correction turned on, which is correspondent to quite a big difference in, in, in dose if you, if you would sort of target a specific signal difference to noise ratio. The, so the, the penalty of having the, the charge sharing correction is since we're looking at neighbor pixels, there is higher probability that there is actually uh, real signals that turn up on the neighbor pixels that we either discard or we count them as something else. So in this plot, I've shown the, the typical count rates that we get. So about six to 700,000 counts per pixel per second with the, the charge sharing correction turned on. If we turn it off, we go above 3 million counts per pixel per second. Photon counting also allows us, of course, to have a very high uh, dynamic range. Uh, 
So in this example, it's for uh, an industrial inspection, but this is just made to show the point of, of the high dynamic range. This is scanning 500 millimeters per second with the range of, of objects ranging from eight centimeters of aluminum to PC boards and, and so on. So with the fast scanning, we can maintain the high position resolution so we can maintain the five line pairs per millimeter even at, at scanning half a meter per second. Uh, if you look at this, you see the, the, the steps of the aluminium, but now with exactly the, the exact same image, we also see this piece of tape uh, in the same image because the dynamic range is, is so high. And you see the structure of this foam type carbon fiber uh, compared to the background. And if you compare that to uh, a charge integrating detector, it is saturating after a certain point, so the, the actual exposure parameters are much more uh, important to keep in, in mind in, in, a, in a charge integrating detector. The other thing we can do with thresholding is to do scatter ejection. If we know, for example, in this case, this is an, an iron uh, step wedge at 160 kV, we know that there's very few photons coming through the step wedge that are below 80 kV. So if you look at this curve right here, you can see it has a slope. And this is taking into account all the photons. If we look at the photons that are above 80 kilovolts, you can see that this is now smooth again. So it removes a lot of, of, of the scattered photons. And the last bit is, is now for the uh, DQE. So at an RK5 spectra, so 70 kV, uh, 20 millimeters of uh, minium. You can see the four curves are for two different thicknesses, 0.75 millimeters with and without charge sharing correction and two millimeters with and without charge sharing correction. You can see a loss of the QE of the two millimeter one with the charge sharing correction turn off. And this is exactly your question before I started that there is a diffusion at a low uh, soft spectra a lot of the photons, most of the photons are converted at the top of the crystal and they do spread a little bit as they go down. But with the charge sharing correction, we sum the neighbor pixels, which means that we bring it back in, into one pixel. Uh, moving on to RQA9, so 120 kilovolts with 40 millimeters. Now you can see the difference between the 0.75 and 2 millimeter thickness because we do convert more of the photons, of course, than at at the two millimeter thick crystal. There is a benefit. You don't, if you look closely at this, there's not a big difference in DQE with charge sharing correction turn on and turn off. And if you look at the MTF, it's clearly better at, the, the, in the case we're using the, the anti-coincidence charge sharing correction. Uh, but it's compensated a bit by when we turn on the charge sharing correction, we don't have the blur of the signal and when we don't have the blur of the signal we're increasing the high frequency noise so that is compensating so actually the the dqe doesn't change uh, in the case with or without uh, anti-coincidence logic of course since it's counting and what i started with is that we don't have noise well this is this is also showing that as the dqe going down to, to 6.6 .6 nanograys uh, per frame uh, you don't see any difference so with that, I think I'll, I'll quit and welcome any questions that you may have.